Welcome to Interviews from Quito. My name is Gregory Wilpert. And today I have with me uh, Antonis Brumas, who is a uh, Greek activist and uh, also in, in very involved in uh, social movements in Greece. And he's also a technology lawyer. With him, we'll be talking about the, uh, about the situation in Greece and uh, the prospects for the left in Europe in general. As well as I also have with me today uh, Ulrich Brandt, who is a political scientist from the University of Vienna and has written a lot on European politics and world politics and particularly also alternatives to neoliberalism. So thank you for joining me today. Hello, thank you very much. So let's uh, first start with uh, what's going on in Greece. Since uh, uh, recently the uh, new elections have been announced, a, set, a date has been set, um, Alexis Tsipras has resigned from the prime ministership uh, and uh, it looks like a very dramatic situation for Greece, uh, given that they've just approved a, a third rescue pa economic rescue package. What you, would you say, given the situation and the situation of the social movements in Greece, what do you think uh, are the prospects for the elections, particularly for the left, and then beyond that for the, uh, for the rescue package of what's going on? In Greece. Well, it's uh, very dramatic indeed. Uh, Syriza was elected just uh, seven months ago uh, with uh, a, a political program to break with the austerity, uh, the vicious circle of austerity. And this was uh, actually the aspiration of uh, the majority of the Greek people. Uh, within these seven months, uh, Greece has been in the media, in global media, uh, all the time. Uh, negotiations lasted for uh, most of uh, this period uh, without any actual result, without any um, uh, any concessions, any kinds of concessions uh, by the external debtors of uh, Greece. Uh, so the, the negotiations were actually uh, on the basis of, on a take it or leave it basis on the part of. Uh, of uh, the Troika, the, uh, uh, that is the, uh, uh, the debtors, the, the three debtors of Greece. And uh, uh, the final result was that uh, Tsipras succumbed to the pressures of uh, uh, the debtors uh, in a very uh, horrid situation for the Greek people, uh, which climaxed with the closing of the banks and uh, with a referendum where um, the, the majority of the, the Greek people, 62% of the Greek people, rejected the austerity only to see uh, after two days uh, the austerity coming back. So if, um, if a new government comes to office and looks like Syriza is, is ahead in the polls, uh, what will they actually be able to do? Uh, and what will the, how will the Greek people, particularly the social movements, react to this new austerity package that essentially is a continuation of the previous austerity packages, which have uh, just led Greece further down a economic uh, depression and, and a very deep hole? Well, uh, the, uh, the problem is that uh, um, although Syriza was blackmailed in uh, the first place, and this was really a coup, a kind of a coup against the democratically elected government, uh, right now Syriza has uh, made a U-turn and uh, has uh, taken the, 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 the program, uh, the austerity programs, uh, uh, through this agreement as its own program. Uh, only saying that uh, we will have, we will take some parallel measures that will ameliorate this damage. Uh, but uh, the problem is that uh, the austerity uh, programs that have been already implemented to Greece for the past five years have not solved the problem of the debt. Uh, in contrary, uh, we began with uh, a, a GDP slash debt ratio of uh, 123%, uh, if I remember well, and now it's uh, nearing to 180%, and it, in to, uh, 2016 it, uh, it's expected to reach 200%. So it's obvious that uh, uh, this vicious circle of austerity is not aimed to uh, solve the problem of the Greek debt. Then w and then we have to uh, to ask ourselves what is the aim of uh, uh, these austerity programs. What would you say is the aim? 
uh, my, my opinion is that uh, uh, the aim of these programs is to change the uh, social structures of the, the, of the, the structures of Greek society in a neoliberal uh, direction. Mm. This is for sure. So the main pillars of the program are um, labor reforms, uh, which strike in um, uh, the protection of labor, and uh, also a cut pensions and uh, uh, salaries all the time, and uh, change labor relations to precarious relations. Uh, it's also um, a program with a, 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 an intense privatization of uh, all public goods and the common goods of the country. Uh, imagine that uh, this program um, has, um, uh, has a condition of uh, uh, conducting 50 billion of 50 billion uh, euros of uh, privatizations. Mm. This uh, literally means that we have to sell the country, mm. and uh, uh, the first 25 billions will uh, be given to restructure the Greek banking system, which is a zombie bank banking system right now. So it's like uh, selling islands to uh, restructure zombie banks. Mm. Yeah, just. Uh, in terms of what this means also in terms of uh, left politics in general, I just want to ask you, um, I mean, given this enormous uh, power that the Troika is exerting on the Greek people, um, uh, and, that, and obviously the European Union as such is being structured in such a way to do that, what do you think that means for left politics in general in Europe? I mean, what can uh, individual governments or social movements try to achieve or try to change given this tremendous um, power that they're exerting that is, seems to be crushing uh, these movements? What, what, what's, what can be done? Yeah, I would like to start to say there were a lot of expectations when the um, Syriza party won the elections um, end of uh, January, because for the first time a government sat at the table in Brussels and tried to negotiate and we had to learn that uh, the European Union and the Troika institutions were not, are not only neoliberal and authoritarian, but they are also imperial. Um, within the European Union and I think that we have to rethink now the European Union, especially in Germany and Austria. The leftist forces always defended the European Union as a project of unification, of a political unification after the Second World War. And of course we criticized uh, since uh, a long time the neoliberal and authoritarian um, um, direction of the development, but now the, the attempt from the Greek government to run the institutions into a crisis and to rethink and to restructure the European Union failed. So for the progressive forces in Europe, it's not only movements, it's also um, political parties, of course, trade unions, um, is to rethink what we want from the European Union. Acknowledging, and this is a strategic problem, that there, of course there is not a European left. There are enormous differences, let's say, among trade unions in Germany, um, the Netherlands and Austria, where the economy works well, also partly due to the crisis in the south of Europe. So how to unify these forces, how to set up space to discuss, to have trust and then to think um, in, a, in a common project which cannot um, 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 yeah, subordinate um, progressive politics to the interests of banks, of transnational capital, of um, the power of the European Central Bank. We should also start a debate about the Euro. How, what does it mean for France, for, um, for Austria, for other countries to be in the Euro? Not only the weak economies, if you like, but also the, the economies which are a bit in the crisis or even the strong economies. We need to start this debate. We even didn't start it yet. Hmm. Uh, returning to Greece for a second, I mean, mm -hmm. right now uh, Syriza actually faces a very difficult situation because it's a left platform split off from Syriza trying to form a new party. Um, are they engaging in this kinds of debates that Ulrich is talking about, so rethinking the role of the Euro, rethinking the role of the European Union, uh, and or what is going on within the Greek left? Well, the, the, the fact is that uh, from uh, the past seven months of uh, these negotiations and then of uh, the um, disappointment of the Greek people because their um, vote in the referendum was actually uh, overturned. Um, the Greek people themselves are thinking 
over again on the European project and their role in the European project and their position in the Euro and the European Union. And uh, I, I can say that uh, this reaches uh, all parts of society. And uh, of course, uh, the, the personal, uh, the individual position uh, of each person uh, varies, but uh, the fact is that uh, um, many people have second thoughts on uh, the Greek uh, participation both in the Euro and in the Eurozone. Mm -hmm. And, but this is so you're saying this goes beyond just the, the party, but also in, throughout the Greek exactly, population. Exactly. Now the left pl platform tries to represent this uh, no vote in, of the referendum in the in the ballots right now. Uh, this is their project. Um, my opinion is that uh, they face certain uh, problems with their communication. They have to uh, offer a viable alternative to the Greek people, a, a, an alternative that will be uh, uh, based to the, uh, to the co ordinary uh, everyday needs of the people, uh, rather than uh, a program that says we are against or in favor of the memorandum, uh, these fa false dilemmas that say uh, Euro or drachma, mm -hmm. uh, austerity or no austerity. You have to have a vision for the future mm -hmm. that makes sense. I mean, that is exactly actually one of the topics that you've worked on. Um, what, what would you say ought to be that alternative uh, according to your own work and your own work with those movements? Well, the, the Greek social movements throughout these five years uh, have made a tre tremendous attempts to uh, re restructure social life, restructure uh, the uh, disintegrating uh, Greek society, uh, uh, not only in terms of uh, public goods and the uh, solidarity networks, uh, but also uh, in terms of uh, um, defending and promoting the common goods of the country, uh, even at uh, uh, the, the level of public services. For example, our uh, public broadcaster, Earth was shot, uh, shut down and then was run by the, the people and the workers together collectively for almost two years uh, as a common good. Um, um, but we shouldn't fetishize the bottom-up approach of solving the crisis because it has certain limitations. Uh, we have to take into account a top-down uh, approach too. Mm. Well, actually, that's also something that you've worked on um, in terms of trying to find an alternative for uh, governments, left governments, well, let's say, if they come into uh, office. So uh, what, what would this top down that is from the governmental level, uh, what would this alternative look like in the context, let's say, starting with the European Union, then we can talk about other examples. Mm -hmm. The parties um, act mainly at the national level. This is a problem because you have the competition, you have the different um, experiences and um, standards of living. But I would say talking about the, the rich countries, if like in the powerful countries like Germany, a leftist initiative would be to promote a discourse and real policies to change societies there, for example, to reduce the working hours to lower the enormous pressure. The whole debate um, in, in Germany and throughout Europe is the, the policy demands currently are grows, grows and grows. So what is an alternative to this capitalist um, growth imperative, which is all over the world, also in Latin America or China or elsewhere? So what are the concrete initiatives to have public services? and not so many cars, but public transport. What are the initiatives? Not to privatize, but to have a strong public sector. What is the investment in specific branches which are ecologically, but also economically, not any longer, um, not futurable, if you like. So to have these initiatives to promote a public discourse and to link it to other leftist countries, coming back to Greece, Syriza uh, and the government was so sticked to the negotiations and to be in Brussels, what does it mean from these very, very important actors, imagine Tsipras and Varoufakis are European intellectuals, not to travel only, if you like, important enough to Brussels, to, to um, Berlin, uh, to, to Rome and to Paris, but also to help to structure spaces for discussion, to, to, um, to exchange the, uh, the alternative experiences 
to really create those initiatives at the European level. I think these are necessary strategic debates, but acknowledging, as um, Antonis just said for Greece, that also in Germany and other countries, a lot of alternatives are already formulated, mm -hmm. but they are, if you like, below the radar. So to strengthen them and to put more um, initiatives, as I said, for example, the dramatic reduction of the working hours, which would be a major case in Germany, not only to fight unemployment, but also to, to uh, overcome productivism, consumerism, this very, very strong orientation towards competitiveness. And to have a European debate about this, and then the next step would be, of course, to go beyond. What does it mean for Latin America, for Africa, for Eastern Europe, for China, and so on? Mm -hmm. Staying just a little bit more in Europe, I mean, uh, another country, of course, that is facing severe economic problems is Spain, uh, which is also uh, facing an election with a very strong left movement, Podemos, or left party. Um, what do you see you know, their strategy in those, in taking into account what you just said? What is it, how, do you, how would you evaluate their strategy in terms of trying to formulate an alternative and actually winning or at least uh, making major inroads into the political mm -hmm. system there? I would say this is the next round of struggle without not to go into the trap that it's only then Podemos and the Europe as it was Syriza in the European Union. We have to, to change um, um, also elsewhere. But the difference between Greece and Spain is that Spain is a much larger uh, economy, that it's much more important at the uh, European level. And I hope, and it's already the case, that Podemos is going to, uh, to learn from the Greek um, experience. Which is hard because now the Spanish people who are hopefully going to vote for Podemos might think, oh, if we are then from the first day on under pressure from the European institutions, maybe we go to, uh, we, we vote for other parties. But I think the answers of Podemos are very, very smart. For example, to build alliances at the communal, uh, the local elections the, um, which took place, they won not because of Podemos, but because they f were part of broad alliances to really formulate alternatives, um, the alternatives in the housing sector uh, against uh, how, um, the eviction um, processes and so on. I think that their Podemos is quite smart. What is also, I would say, with, with no arrogance, please, that Podemos also should overcome to think itself only at the national level as it uh, did Syriza, but to think that Podemos is part of a European movement, this is also, and, and of European alternatives, this is also our duty in countries like uh, Germany and Austria, but also to think what are then the first and very important initiatives at the European level to counter any attempt, and this, there will be many attempts to put pressure on, an, on a uh, government um, led by Podemos, um, to really create alternatives and not to, to get again into the trap of, of debt negotiations. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things, though, about Podemos, or one of the interesting things, I think, about Podemos is also that some of their leaders have said that they've actively uh, learned from uh, the example in Latin America and have been here. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, Juan Carlos Monedero, who was for a while in the leadership of Podemos, spent a lot of time in Venezuela. Uh, I'm wondering, again, with the, uh, relating it again to the Greece example, is there anything that you think the uh, uh, Syriza or the Greek uh, left has, I mean, you're right now visiting also in Latin America, mm -hmm. is there anything that you think can be taken back from the Latin American experience to Europe? Well, uh, European societies are uh, <coughs> very much different than uh, uh, Latin American societies, and the same goes for the European states. Uh, furthermore, in Europe you have a, a, a very strong transnational institution that is supposed to 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 uh, go for a federalism uh, to be a federalist state uh, and uh, this uh, means many things for the national level uh, actually uh, as Uli rightly uh, been pointed uh, the problem with uh, the European uh, movements is that they are not consolidated at the European level. So we face a, a dominant power, that's the power of the market and the transnational institutions of the, the European project, let's say, which is institutionally uh, neoliberal, but uh, the, the social subjects uh, are not yet consolidated at uh, uh, this transnational level. They are mostly national so we have to to break uh, to to uh, we have to to change levels we have to go to the transnational level and this uh, happened during a bit uh, just a bit but it shows that there is such a perspective it happened during the no vote of the greek referendum where, where you have 
solidarity um, initiatives in other countries. Uh, and my opinion is that uh, Greek, uh, Greek and European social movements uh, have a lot to learn from the Latin American experience. Definitely. And, uh, but leftist parties of Europe uh, have to learn more. Uh, have to learn more about the dialectics between movements and governments in power. And uh, of course, there's a lot of conversation to, to talk about this point. Mm. Mm. I, I would add that the European Union, of course, is much more multiscalar and the power of the European institutions is so strong that we have to think at this international or European level. I think what we can learn for any progressive project, which is, I would say, far away, but we have to build it, starting with movements, with alternative experiences, also with leftist parties, with trade unions, which are in some countries still strong and important, that we should not trust into a constellation which was then the, the, um, um, the case in Latin America with the um, rising uh, prices for commodities, for oil, for gas, um, for, for minerals. And then it was a boom and the uh, uh, progressive governments had a lot of um, space for action and they could distribute and so on. But my impression is that they, they are still very much in the logic of a distributive left. And what we need is a transformative left. And so what does it mean for Europe, but I would also say for Latin America, to go beyond and to really change society, which means class relations, gender relations, to have a good living for all, not only via distribution, but as a, as a life, mm. to have different societal nature relations and not to, to, um, to um, yeah, exploit uh, too much uh, nature. In Europe, we don't have these extractivist um, um, uh, development models, but we have an industrialist model which is destroying in Latin America and elsewhere, and it refers very much to the world market. So, any progressive alternative, from my perspective, needs to rethink how societies are inserted into the world market, into global politics, and to formulate a progressive project also at the international level, which would for me mean to regulate the world market, mm -hmm. to have a solidarity international politics which overcomes the structural competition among the nation states and among, among regions. We are starting this debate, but this is very weak. Mm. A final point, I think, where Latin America is very, very important for the, for the European alternative debates, in a constellation, as I said, where you have only three demands, which is gross, 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 is this debate on the buen vivir, on the good living, which is not romanticized, which isn't, ah, the indigenous are so pure and they are so close to nature, but to insist that the, the historical tie in Europe between capitalist growth and well-being for the masses is broken mm -hmm. due to um, the polarization of society, due to the power of the financial markets, due to e um, ecological destruction. So to reformulate the project of a good living against the capitalist growth imperative. And I think there is a lot of debate uh, going on in, in, um, in Europe. At the, edges, uh, at the edges, of course, so, um, we should not confuse ourselves, but it enters into leftist parties, it enters into um, public discourses, and there is a lot of reference made to Latin America. Yeah, I mean, I think that's certainly true. I mean, the other thing, though, I just want to add to what you're saying, I think that's also true that uh, that uh, there's been a lot of focus on the redistributive policies, mm -hmm. but there is also an undercurrent, also on the edges, I would say, perhaps, uh, of uh, efforts to reestablish the new relations w uh, between state and society. And I think it's particularly strong, I think, perhaps in, in Venezuela with, with the communal mm -hmm. councils and the communes that are being set up. Um, uh, and then, you know, in Bolivia and in Ecuador, they've been talking about it, but haven't really moved moved forward yet on those issues. But uh, at least it's, you know, there's some mm -hmm. thinking and yeah. I think that might deepen when the economic, uh, or the, 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 the commodity prices are really going to have an economic impact. But anyway, we're unfortunately out of town, uh, time and uh, uh, so, but, so we have to end it here. But I want to thank you very much for joining thank us. Thank you too. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you for joining us at Interviews from Quito. My guests were today were Antonis Brumas from Greece and Ulrich Brandt from the University of Vienna. Uh, thank you and hope you join us next time. <laughs>